there is a lot of talk about compression lately and we had the first compressed nft mint hello and welcome to another computer science basics and a little bit of solana tutorial today we're going to talk about merkel trees yes that's a concept that as a developer on Solana, you should know, should. Well, you might want to know because it's used for account compression. I mean, it's used in several areas. So today I'm going to explain to you what a Merkle tree is, why it's useful and what it's used for on Solana. Because lately there's so much talk about compressed NFTs and I just don't want to miss it. And since Merkle trees are just so essential to understanding NFT compression, I want to make a specific video just for that. We're going to talk about compressed NFTs in future videos in more detail. This is just an outline for, you know, technical background for understanding Merkle trees. Let's go. So, um, do we start here? That's really just is the outline. What is compression for NFTs? Blah, 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 blah. Merkle tree. That's actually a nice side. I've seen this before. We're going to get there. We're going to see what all of that means but let's start with the basics and actually let me jump over to this screen and our favorite graphics tool ms paint and i'm gonna use my fat finger to draw stuff this can only go well so basically we're talking about data structures so we have like our i don't know data one two forty two i can't think of any better way how to write this we have some data that we store. Now you already know a few data structures, presumably, like the array where essentially everything is just stored after each other. So we have like a bunch of data sequentially after each other. First index, there's some data. Second index, there's some data. There's some data, there's some data and so on. We can also have it in like a list where like the first element points to the next element and so on point point i'm doing such good job in drawing so that would be a list and there are different data structures and each of them have different advantages and disadvantages otherwise there would only be one data structure but no there are many one of them is a tree so what is a tree there this thing this is a tree wonderful what <laughs> what I you want to mess with me? What is a tree in computer science? There, there we have trees in computer science. Basically, it's a data structure again, where we have our nodes and then they point from one node to the next node, like in a list, but now we have a kind of a hierarchy. Yes, yes, I'm doing so well. This is going great. Great graphics, Andy. Wow, all those animations. Check this out. And inside those nodes, there's also some data. The data would then be inside those inside those nodes. And, you know, as with a list, the data structure stores the data itself plus the reference to the next element. Here in the tree, we have the data itself plus reference to the next element or elements and we call the uppermost thing this here the root of the tree and the outermost this a leaf so if it doesn't have any children anymore then this is called a leaf so you know it's like a tree it's like our tree just that it's upside down looks pretty much the same doesn't it we have the root and then the leaves that's a tree you're welcome now you know. I never said I'm good at like graphics. I just said I'm good at explaining data structures, lol. Anyway, so that's a generic tree. We can make a recursive definition of this is a tree and it can have a number of children that again are a tree. So this here is once again a tree and then it can have children again, which are again trees. And then the base case, it's, it's a leaf. It doesn't have any children anymore, which again, is a tree. Only a root is also a tree, a tree with one element. Cool. That's a generic tree. Then we can have more specific trees like a binary tree. Binary, in case you have ever heard of the binary system where we have ones and zeros, 
two states, a binary tree can have two children. So this is not a binary tree. Man, I should have really worked with layers, eh? I'm just gonna erase some stuff here. Oh, this is working great. Okay, now it's a binary tree. It's not a very balanced binary tree. I'll put this here. Whee! This thing has only a right node and no left node. But that's fair enough, it is still a binary tree. If we wanted to have a balanced binary tree, we could, you know, copy that part over here. Paint, our favorite program. There we go, balanced binary tree. But do not make it too difficult. Let's just, I just remove this entire thing here. Uh, put the one in here. There we have a balanced binary tree now because we have the same amount of children here as we have here. And then from the binary tree, there are specific binary trees like a binary search tree that only has an additional condition that all the elements on the left side are smaller than the root and all the elements on the right side are larger than the root. So we have uh, built an inverted binary search tree where essentially it's just mirrored, which is also a binary search tree. It's just that the larger and smaller is, I should have done that differently, but hey, let's uh, use the great tools we have available in paint and flip this. And now you just need to read the numbers uh, inverted and b there you go, you have a binary search tree. All the elements on the left side are smaller than the root and all the elements on the right side are larger than the root. And that of course also applies for all the subtrees. So the 69 is larger than the 42 and whatever would be here would have to be larger than two but smaller than 42. And that's trees, very simply explained with great graphic tools. And I think we're ready to go to Merkle trees because that's essentially what we really want to learn here today. Do I want to stay here with my great graphics tool or do I want to move? Visualgo, that's a great web page for properly visualizing this stuff. If you want to learn more about trees or binary search trees in particular, there, that's that's a, a much much cleaner example. And then you can also play with stuff like I want to insert my 42 now and then it even goes through the algorithm of how it would insert that. It would find the right spot and then append it here. Boom, still have a binary search tree. But the point of this entire video is not to explain binary search trees. It's about Merkle trees. And we have another tool here that displays Merkle trees. A Merkle tree is again a binary tree because it has one left and one right child. It is also a balanced binary tree because the depth is the same for all the leaves. And the difference is the data we only store in the leaves. In our great example, that would mean that we, we store our data down here. So all the data is in the leaves. And what do we put in here? We put a hash of our leaves, in this case, 69 and two. Well, actually there's another step really that I omitted now. Maybe let's also draw that because really data is here and in here is already the hashes. That would be the hash of 69, the hash of 2, 42, 1. And then up here we have the hash of hash of 69 and hash of 2. And then here the hash of hash of 42 and hash of 1. So really we build the hashes up to here. Great, you can totally, totally see what I mean here. Let's go back to the nicer visualization here. So essentially we have the data and then whatever the data is, is hashed. So let's put in some data. We have those two leaves here and the data is hashed and then those two hashes are hashed again. And then we have the hashes from this group and from this group and they're again hashed to this hash. And then we have this and this, the hashes of all of that and they're again hashed to this root. And that's the Merkle root. So to simplify again, all the data is in the leaves and the remaining nodes up to the root are always the hashes of elements. And this now has the nice property that as soon as one of the data elements changes, the root definitely also changes. Why? Well, let's say I change this two here, then this, this, and this hash will change. Watch it. Boom. Why is this not working? Ah, that I can update. What? Anyway, point is, you see, if I update something here, like leave number five, so this one, 
then this hash, this hash, and this hash will change. Let's go. There, you saw those three changed. Because obviously, if this element changes, then the hash of both of those elements change, which makes this hash change, which makes this hash change. By the way, I forgot to say, a hash function just basically takes all the data in and then produces some kind of output. And that output will be different when the data is different. So even if just one bit changes in the data, the hash will be completely different. That's one of the properties of hash functions. That's why we use that here. So we can guarantee that if one of our data elements change, then the Merkle root will change. And now we can use that knowledge to just remember the Merkle root and by that guarantee that all our data is still consistent. In the concrete example of Solana NFTs, if the data down here is our NFT metadata and then we hash all of the metadata and then we hash the hashes and then we just store the Merkle root, then given all of our metadata and the Merkle root, we can verify that none of the metadata has been tampered with, which means we don't need to store all of the metadata on chain anymore. We just store the Merkle root on chain and then we can still prove on chain that none of the data has been tampered with. Data that we then store off chain somewhere, maybe shadow drive or wherever, plug for shadow drive. And that's the concept of a Merkle tree. Or another example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin also uses Merkle trees to pack their transactions. So not all of the transaction data needs to be in the Bitcoin header. All the transactions go in here at the data fields and then they're hashed, 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 hashed up to the Merkle root and only the Merkle root goes into the Bitcoin header and is propagated on the network. Otherwise it would be way too much data. So yeah, Merkle trees are quite an important concept in blockchain technology. So yeah, good that we talk about it, I guess. By the way, Merkle trees are also sometimes called hash trees. But now I have a question for you. Why do we go through the effort of building this tree of hashes if we could just hash each element and hash each hash with the next hash and so build like a list of hashes and then the very last hash with that one we can also guarantee that none of the previous elements has been tampered with. I mean, that's also a very common concept in blockchain technology where we, you know, hash each block and include the hash in the next block. And so, and hash that again, you know? I mean, why build a tree in that case? I give you a few seconds to think about that. You may pause the video and think about that some longer, some longer, a bit longer. And then now I'm gonna give you my solution or my answer to this question. It is true that if we were to just hash all the data and have one hash, that we could still guarantee that nothing has been changed. However, the advantage of the tree comes in when we also want to update our data. Because if we now change one of the elements here, in this case, we just need to change the one, two, three hashes. In general, log n hashes, because with each step, you know, we double the amount. So if you want to have it exact, it's a log two of n hashes we need to update. If we change an element in here and we had just the entire list, then if we change that element, then we need to hash that and hash the next one, hash, 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 go through all the remaining elements until we have the final hash again. So that's up to n elements that we need to hash here. And when you think about it, in terms of our NFTs, that's a lot of compute that we need to hash all of that again. And we don't want to do that. that. That's too much compute. So by building this tree, we do need a bit more storage to store all the hashes. So it's n log n instead of just n. If those asymptotic notations don't ring a bell, that, that's fine. I'm just talking computer science slang here. Slang? No, computer science terms. But therefore we are quicker in the update because we have all the hashes and then when we change an element, we just need to change that one, read the hash that we already have, update this and so on and so on. Boom, I click it and it updates and it updates all the hashes. I'll come back to that in a second. Let's first talk about Merkle trees for account compression on Solana. Account compression. 
There is already a SPL program on chain that provides an interface to create those Merkle trees, more specifically concurrent Merkle trees, and that is used to make edits of off-chain data with on-chain verification. So we just keep the verification of the data integrity on-chain, the Merkle proof, and all of the actual data we store somewhere off-chain. But we can still guarantee that it's the right data because we have the hash of all that data on chain and we will only allow any changes to go through our program. So you need to submit a proof of what you change and that you have the authority to change it. And then the Merkle root is updated. Why do we do that? Well, mainly for NFTs because NFTs are expensive on Solana. If you store it on chain, all those accounts take up a lot of rent, 0.01 sol per NFT, so which is currently like 30 cents per NFT. And that's just too expensive, right? If you wanna send out millions of NFTs for free, you don't wanna pay that, right? That's why you want to compress that data. And by just storing the Merkle root, we can have all of the rest of the data somewhere offline while still being verified by the L1. The solution is to store a compressed hash of the asset data on chain while maintaining the actual data off chain in the database. And with this program, we verify the off chain data on chain and also make concurrent writes to the data. We'll get there. In order to do this, we introduced a new data structure called concurrent Merkle trees to avoid proof collisions while making concurrent writes. So we have discussed what a Merkle tree is. This is a bit of a more of a technical definition here. Each node is the hash of the node to the left and the node to the right. And each leaf node is essentially just the hash of its data. It's a fully balanced binary tree. I said all of that because I am so smart, God damn it. Also I studied computer science and I teach that stuff. So I better know it. Now let's get to that concurrent part. What does that even mean? Done at the same time. In our example of that Merkle tree, a right is instant. But here's the thing, for this write, we need to know the new data, this hash and this hash. So all the things in orange now. If somebody else at the same time wants to do an update, let's say I update this to, I don't know, seven. Then to change this, it had to use this hash and this hash to calculate all the new hashes. We just have three new hashes. Now, obviously all of that is not done on chain, all of those hash calculations. First of all, it would be too much compute. And secondly, the data is not on chain. So we can't do that on chain. What we do is we create a proof that we've changed the data in a certain way. Merkle proofs, maybe that goes a bit too deep also for my knowledge. But the problem that we have with this is quite easy to understand. The guy who inserted the 42 here or updated the data to 42, he changes those hashes. And if I now update the seven and I calculate my proof with the previous hash, because I didn't know that this one would be updated to 42. When I create my proof for my seven, it was still other hashes. And then I calculate the proof for it with the, the old hash. And then obviously the Merkle root will be different to what it would be if there's already the 42. So if two updates happen at the same time or even just very close to each other and the second one just doesn't have the up-to-date data from the first one, then the second one will be invalid with a normal Merkle tree. And that's where this concurrent Merkle tree idea comes in. So in this example, if we update the x5 here, it changes this and this. And then we update the x6 here, it changes this and this. So obviously the Merkle roots will be different. And with this concurrent replacement, we ensure that the proof is still valid, even if we don't use the most up-to-date hashes. Let's try and understand how that works. To circumvent this problem, we maintain a change log of updates that have been made to the tree. When adding a new leaf in the second tree, we do the following. Take the X or of the leaf indices. The depth at which you have to make the swap is the number of leading zeros in the result. So the X or, hold on, what do we do? We X or leaf indices of the change log path and the new leaf. 
yeah okay and with that we can then find out how deep we need to go in replacing okay at that depth change the node in the proof to the node in the change log right because we don't need to go all the way down here because those two we don't care about yet we only care about this one because that's the one that we also use to calculate our root and the x or in base 2 essentially that's just a fancy way of calculating which depth we need to go because if we have index 0 and index 3 then the x ors of that will be 0 0 x or 1 1 will be 1 1 and then the leading zeros of the result in that case 0 is the depth at which we have to make the change. So if we're far away, we don't have leading zeros. In my mind, that makes sense. I mean, I could try and draw it for you and it's not that important. Essentially, this is the calculation that just calculates how deep we need to go in our update. Like how, f how essentially it calculates how close are we together. Our index and this index, how close are we together? And since we are a binary tree and we operate on base two, it works with that XOR. It's, it's actually pretty genius, but um, probably not the most important thing to understand, I guess. I just find it nice and, and, and well thought out. And at that depth, we change the node in the proof to the node in the change log. Yeah, I mean, okay, so far, so good. We just replace that one element there. So in this example, with the six and the five, the indices were zero, one, and two. So the indices were one and two. So one X or two is zero, one, one. I don't know why they write another zero here. That doesn't make sense. So it's zero, one X or one, zero, which is one, one. And so we have no leading zeros, which means we start at depth one because there's also a add one here. That's why we start at depth one. So the new proof is for leaf x7 to x2 and the new proof we just replace the x2 with the one from the change log uh, we use xor because it's efficient yes binary operations that's that's a good the xor is a good solution solana imposes transaction size restriction hence the program also provides the ability to cache the uppermost part of the concurrent merkle tree called a canopy which is stored at the end of the account so we can cache the upper part of our Merkle tree to make this work. Because how I understand this, the new proof, this part, where we replace that part, that we then have to do on chain, right? That new proof, the program executes. The other proof we do on client side. So those two proofs are on client side, but then if I need to change something to make it concurrent, then that part is executed on the actual program, right? Would be my assumption now, because I still submit the same proof and then the program fixes them to make it concurrent. Just my assumption now, I don't actually know much about this yet. Examples. So account compression is the general thing. It has really been developed for working with Metaplex compressed NFTs. That's what it's been optimized for. But you can compress any kind of account if you want. Merkle tree tests. Oh, because I read depth. Another very important aspect that I have not really discussed yet. Because of the exponential nature of binary trees, that being with every level that we go down, we double the amount of data that we can store. Like if we just were to hash two elements in one root, it's two, next level four, then eight, then 16, 32, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. That grows exponentially. And that's what makes it possible to store a lot of NFTs within one such Merkle tree. We're then just limited by the depth for compute reasons, I assume, because at some point the proofs will just get too big and therefore also too long to compute. I think, I don't actually know this, but that's my assumption. And so there's the account compression program in the SPL, in the Solana program library. And it is used by Metaplex Bubblegum, which is a Metaplex program that does the compressed NFTs. Just in case you want to have a look at that, we will eventually. But today I want to just focus on 
just the pure Merkle tree stuff, the pure account compression program and have a look how that works. At least a little bit, at least tease it a little bit because you can compress anything with that, any, any type of data, any account. So let's have a look to get just a bit of an understanding of how that would work on Solana. And then we'll dive deeper into the compressed NFTs in some future video. Cause you can't do everything in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day, damn it. Compressed NFTs also weren't built in a day, but now they're ready, they are ready. So we wanna have a look at all that stuff. Right, so let's open some code. All right, and we will start by installing a bunch of packages. I typed that really quickly. No, it just copied it really slowly. There we go. In our first example, we create a tree. Paste all of that into here. All right, let's import some stuff. Import from Solana SPL account compression. Now, actually we need to make connections and all of that stuff. Who's the guy who makes the trees grow? Gardener? Garu. Garu? Garu, you my key pair. We have our payer, we have our connection. What else do we need? A max depth and the max buffer size argument. So if we want to store, I don't know, we just store like 10 elements or something. If we want to have 10 elements, then we need to have 16 nodes because that's the next power of two and that's two to the one, two, four, eight, 16, five. Just have a max depth of five and a max buffer size. I think that buffer size is how many concurrent writes we can have, how much of that, of the change log we buffer. And I'm not sure, so I don't know. We also put just three, who cares? I'm just gonna play around with it and, and see what happens. We can assume we have a payer key pair. Yes, we have that. And then we generate one for the Merkle tree and then we create the instruction to allocate that Merkle tree. Oh. Cool, it must be a multiple of two, at least eight. Okay, sure, then I, I take the smallest one. Thank you for suggesting that. See, that's why I like that to be typed. It's pretty cool. And the canotopy depth. Oh, that is now how much of that we buffer. That's how much of those we buffer. So there was a note down here. Not like that's too important. So zero depth, one, two, three, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. A depth of three, why not? Cool, then we create an instruction to initialize the newly created Merkle tree with that key pair. So that's the Merkle tree account. And then we put all of that in one transaction and send it off. Cool, let's see if that works. Let's see if we can make a tree. No, attempt to debit an account. I ain't got no sol, I got two sol. Oh, am I trying to pay with this? Yeah, the first signer is the fee payer. So this guy tries to pay the transaction, which obviously it can't because it's just a new key pair. All right, well, just move that around then. I'm now the fee payer. Does that change it? I'm so glad that I understand stuff now and can fix those things quickly. There we go, we got a signature. Check this out, yo. So we paid for this account a 3TG. That's probably my tree. And we used the system program, the account compression program, and some noob, whatever that is. So first we created an account with a bunch of bytes. And then we have the init empty Merkle tree with the 3TG as the tree and me as the authority, the gardener as the authority, and whatever a noob is. Can somebody explain to me what a noob is? I know what a noob is, but not what a noob is. That's also a program. That program is even being executed here with the instruction data of that. Account compression program calls the noob program Return success, return success. So not much interesting stuff going on here. Did we put the system program instruction as a normal create account? So apparently behind that alloc account instruction just hides another system program create account instruction. Can I go there? Yeah, <laughs> literally just a system program create account instruction. From the payer, that's the new tree and the lampwords are 
required space and required space. And then we can could also see how that is calculated. We have two plus header beat plus the factory byte size plus the canopy and that thing rabbit holes man i tell you rabbit holes okay anyway let, let's just say that uh, this function knows how to calculate that required space of the merkle tree and then it's just a system program create account so that's a system program created account instruction and then here this create init empty merkle tree that just creates a instruction as we know it from we have the accounts and we have the data there serialize instruction discriminator and then the arguments the arguments yeah we could dive deeper here and read the code but like it's an instruction to create that wonderful merkle tree plus also it provides another program noob is the SPL noob program. So it's just a noob program. Do I know what the noob program is? No. Do you want to find out? Eh, eventually, not now. So that has worked. We managed to create a tree. <laughs> now what do we do with it? I mean, we can go check it out. Like probably just a bunch of random data. So we see that it's a bunch of zeros. And before that, bit of data, and then a bunch of zeros again, and then a bit of data again. Okay, <laughs> okay. We could look how that tree is represented on chain, but I, I guess that's not too important. We would know where to look though, right? Because we have the program and then, oh, look, there's a noob. Can we find out what that is? SPL noob rust, which does nothing, okay. Its primary use is circumventing log truncation when emitting application data. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> it's a program that does nothing. It's literally a program that does nothing. Amazing, I love it. I love it, I love it. And there's a use case for it. See, you can build productive programs even if you can't really program. Anyway, account compression. That's the interesting uh, part that we wanted to look at. And then there's probably a state somewhere. Yes, and then we have a concurrent Merkle tree header. And here we could have a look how that header would look like approximately. That, 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 that. Okay, and the tree size depends on the max depth and the max buffer size. And with both of those, we get like values. And yeah. Okay, so those are the allowed combinations, I guess. I've picked... A correct one, wait, what did I pick? Five and eight, five and eight, and that's a valid combination. Actually, let's try. If I were to use five and 256, <laughs> then it's not assignable to type eight. Valid depth si size pair. So five only has eight as a valid. Interesting, very interesting. Anyway, yeah, so here you see the possible combinations. We are digging deep our rabbit holes, deep, deep rabbit holes. I just wanted to uh, have a look at how the count looks, but okay, anyway, back, 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 all the way back. We created a tree now, yay. And uh, now we wanna use this tree somehow. So let's go back to our example and add a leaf to our tree, yes, please. Yes, leave, leaf. Sorry, it's a, it's not a voice dev. Add leaf. We know what a leaf is. That's the data part of the Merkle tree because it's the outermost and in Merkle trees, that's all where the data is. Add leaf, leaf. Okay, so you want some random bytes. Uh, no, you get 32 bytes. There, 42, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 69. That's my data. Add the new leaf to the existing tree. Create append instruction. My CMT, public key, that was our tree, 3TG. So we put our tree here and then we have our payer and our connection. And it's just a new transaction with this create append instruction. What does that actually do? Serializes the data. I mean, let's just try it. Let's go. There we go. So that looks good. So we once we paid for one transaction only. We put in our tree and the compression program and the noob append leaf data. 
There we go. 42.00000000000069. That's my data because I'm creative. That is then also put in the new program, which does nothing with it. There we have some more output at least. We have an active index zero, rightmost index zero, buffer size one, leaf index zero, and we have fast forwarding proof starting index zero. So for now, we're just building the Merkle tree, appending rightmost leaf. So apparently we start at the very right and we appended the rightmost. I haven't fully gotten why we need that new program now, but by calling this program, we emit application data and such that this is not lost. We just call it into a program and then the program does nothing. Is that it? Whatever. We don't need to understand anything. Everything, I mean. It would be good to understand some things. Like, what if we call it again and add the same data one more time as a new leaf to the existing tree. Let's see. Oh, that looks still pretty much the same. Wait, now we don't have as much logs anymore, what? So apparently the second time it doesn't do as many logs anymore. Oh, that's unfortunate. Can I put it eight times more? I'm just playing around with Merkle trees now. Yep, that works. And we've just added more data. Append, 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 append. So that was eight times more. I should not be able to do this one more time. This should now fail because we only have 16 spots. And if we add another eight to already having 10, then we should run out of spaces. But I'm wrong. We can append more. Depend, depend, depend. So we have 18 now. Maybe I'm off by one, which means we would be at 26 now and 32 now. Ah, there we go. Finally, tree is full, cannot append. So hold on. So we had 26 and I wanted to add eight. There we go, with six it works. And now even if I were to append a single one more, it will tell me the tree is full, can't do that. Yep, there we go. Tree is full, cannot append. Nice, cool. We got a full tree, we're a good gardener. Now we come to the fun part, which is we have the Merkle tree and we want to change something in there. Oh, by the way, how does our tree look now? Now that it's a full tree, let's check that account again. No more zeros, eh? Lots of other data. And even though it's the same data in every leaf, the data in here doesn't really seem to repeat. Oh yes, it does, whiz, whiz, whiz. So because always two are hashed, then it have, has the same hash again. The data is always the same. With, but anyway, let's do one of those replaces. This example assumes that the off chain tree has been indexing all previous modifications. It's okay for the indexer to be behind a maximum of max buffer size transactions. Okay, assume off chain tree is a Merkle tree instance. So the data actually needs to be off chain. Maybe the repeating thing that we saw in the account is actually just us storing or caching the canopy. That could be the canopy. Because wait, how many, how big did we say the canopy is? We said our canopy is three. So we would have eight, could have up to eight times the same thing. One, two, three, four, or just four times. Yeah, that also makes sense. What we see here is probably just a canopy. So anyway, let's copy that. And the new leaf is now, I don't know, 796 to change stuff up. So we only have 30 elements. So let's replace the, I don't know, third one. We have our tree. We pay new leaf. And then we need to get the proof from the off chain tree. Now that is the hard part to get. From our actual tree, so the actual data, we need to create a proof for this leaf. We need a Merkle tree proof. Merkle tree, can I get that from somewhere? Yes, for instance, from SPL account compression. How do I build a Merkle tree? Sparse Merkle tree from leaves. This is a recommended way to create Merkle trees. Okay, so we forgot to build the tree at the same time we were, you know, uh, putting it on chain. So let's all do that in one. Sparse Merkle tree from leaves. And there we just put the leaves and we just 
put the same leaf all the time. So I'm just going to put the same buffer here all the time. And then I'm going to put that array of buffers into here. And you also need a depth. Okay. Max depth five. There you go. That's how we build our Merkle tree. And then we can say Merkle tree dot get proof. Haha. -ha, perfect. And we just need to get the proof for one leaf because we are just interested in the hashes that change. So we need to provide the leaf index. If we want to update that 42, then we provide that index for that 42 so that, such that it knows it needs to take that hash and that hash. We're just interested in that part. And other stuff like this hash and this hash, we're not really interested in that, right? We don't need to prove anything for that. Okay, so the off chain tree, called it my tree, M tree get proof for the leaf index. I mean, I would be surprised if that works, but uh, let's see if that works. If it works, it will only work once. It only works once. Damn it, it doesn't work once. How do you do a raise in goddamn TypeScript? No, hey, hey, there we go. Simple as that, maybe. Not my forte. Ha, 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 look at that though. Wow, I, I haven't been so happy for a transaction signature in a while. Look at this. We were able to update our tree. We paid for a transaction, got our tree and a bunch of other accounts that I'm not sure what they used for. And of course the noob and the compression program. And we have the replace leaf. Nice, and we have the root. We have the previous leaf. So that's what I had there with the 42 and the 69. And then we have the new leaf with the seven and the 96. Yes, we define which index we change, the third index. And then that's just for logging. Nice, replace, attempting to fill in proof. Rightmost index is 32. Yeah, so 32 is the highest index. Leaf index is three. Fast forwarding proof starting at index six. Starting at, the, I don't know what that means. That's probably the XOR that it does. So it fast forwards needs to actually change something. So the fast forwarding is I don't need to recalculate stuff if it's already matching because of the XOR. Index six, I don't know why we get to index six. Don't ask me that. But I guess that's fine. It's a, it's a program success and our Merkle tree was successfully updated, which means if I now, ha, huh, but it could still wait. If I now were to update, let's say another one, I would expect it to not work, but then I expect it to work because I just have the not so up-to-date state of the tree and I should still be able to update it. Let's just see. If it was a normal Merkle tree, I shouldn't be able to, but since it's a concurrent Merkle tree, maybe I can still update this thing. Yes, I can still update this thing. So active index is one, rightmost index is 32, leaf index is 12, and then we fast forward to six again. Now, just to break it, if I had a completely wrong tree, like if my old leaves were 41 instead of 42, then it should definitely not work because that's also not an old state of the Merkle tree. That should now definitely not work. There we go. Error message, concurrent Merkle tree error. The tree's current leaf value does not match the supplied proofs leaf value. Yeah, so there is a completely different, completely different tree. Failed to find root in change log, replaying full buffer. Because also the root was changed or the, the root is different. So, uh, and, and it didn't find it in the change log. So it's replaying the entire thing. And then it says, well, nope, that's just wrong. <laughs> Okay, so changing it back to being okay, we can change up to max buffer size leaves before we need to provide the correct Merkle tree again to be able to update again. So we have changed 12, 13, 14, 15, still works. Now number seven and still works and now 18, this could already fail. Or maybe we have one more. <laughs> this one fails. Nice. As predicted. As predicted, we were able to do seven 
updates without having the old Merkle trees really up to date. So the old Merkle tree is now seven updates back, but because we have the buffer size of eight, that was still okay. And now when we do another update, we fail to find the root again in the changelog and we're replaying the full thing. And then invalid root recomputed. So there it just says, this is not a valid tree anymore. There it just doesn't, doesn't know what's going on anymore. So in order to be able to update that, I would have to have a more up-to-date tree here. I'm done soon, don't worry. We'll be, we'll be done soon, but a little more because we don't want to end with an error. Obviously, we want to see how to fix this because we know what the problem is. The problem is our off-chain tree is out of sync, right? Because we didn't update our old leaves and we were updating the on-chain representation. Which index was it? Index 2? Index 3? I don't remember. No, I don't remember. No, I can't rebuild it. We did the 12. What did we do before? The 3. Okay, so if the index is 3, we have the new leaf. Does it work then? Because we're still 7 behind, but 7 behind should still work. No. This should now give me the real state of the tree. So the current state of the tree. If I have the current state of the tree, can I then update? No, I broke it now. We start with index zero. Rightmost index is 32. Does it change anything if I have 32 here? Ha, what? How did that just happen? Okay, so apparently I have 32 leaves. Maybe I just miscounted something at some point. I added 8 plus 8 plus 8 plus 6 plus 2. Of course I added 32. I just can't count. I just can't count. And then I, I missed 2 here. But since it's a concurrent Merkle tree, I could already, without having those two, actually build them. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yep. It's a bit complicated. And I think I get it. <laughs> this is so stupid. But I managed to, to update it again. Yeah, we do have 32. I'm just really bad at counting. We do have 32 elements in the depth five tree. And yeah, that update worked again. Man, those uh, concurrent Merkle trees are pretty cool. Must admit, I like this. And I guess I'll, I'm going to end it here. I hope that you learned something today about Merkle trees in general or data structures in general, Merkle trees in particular, and how we use Merkle trees for account compression, or at least how we use Merkle, concurrent Merkle trees on chain, which we can then use for account compression. Compressed NFTs is definitely going to be a topic of future videos because that is interesting and super useful and will drive a lot of adoption, I assume. In the future, most of the NFTs you'll get will be compressed and then you can make them uncompressed and compress them again and do cool stuff like that. So we do want to learn how all of that works. And that was a good first step in that direction, understanding Merkle trees and playing around with that. I enjoyed today's lesson. I hope you did too. Leave me a like if you did. Check out those videos, subscribe if you haven't already, you know, all the good stuff. And then i see you next time for some more Solana tutorials. Next time we'll open this thing, so spoiler alert, we'll play with a ledger. See you then.